5. 11BX137. A gadget blog named Gadgets with two Zs got international viral attention after they received an exceedingly strange, mysterious CD sent to their address. The blank gold CD has a series of letters and numbers written on it and no other markers denoting what it could be. The contents of the CD when played are very confusing to say the least. Strange and downright horrifying. A hooded figure dressed like a bubonic plague doctor, standing menacingly in what looks like a burnt out, destroyed remnant of a building. He just sort of appears to be standing and communicating in some kind of code. Wandering, posing, revealing a blinking light emanating from the palm of his hand. Its hand, maybe? This thing does kind of have SCP-049 vibes. After about a minute, the hooded figure faces the wall, where he stays for the remainder of the video. But where the video goes from creepy to I might never sleep again levels of horrifying is that when you run the audio through a spectrogram, a fancy word for a visualization of sound, images begin to appear of tortured bodies and a chilling threat spelling out, you are already dead. That's the kind of thing you'd love to receive in the mail unmarked. Internet sleuths the net over came together to try and uncover and unmask this nefarious figure in the terrifying video. Now if it's any comfort for you, the images found in the spectrogram appear to be excerpts from low rent horror movies that people found screen captures that matched up pretty well. Speculation ran wild as to what this video could possibly mean. Was there a secret message or a threat behind its cryptic codes? Was it just an advertisement for something? or just a bored artist trying to get somebody's attention the only way he knew how. Well, eventually, someone did come forward. A man by the name of Parker Warner Wright claims to be the plague doctor in the video and said the reason for the video was nothing more than an art project to entertain and confuse people. Like most cryptic scary artists, when he was asked about why the video was made, all he had to say was, I see my work as waves on the oceans. Thanks. Number four, I feel fantastic. Now, if you're a student in horrifying, unexplained YouTube clips and legends, perhaps you've been unfortunate enough to run into this one before. But if you haven't, I'm sorry. It's been years since I feel fantastic first graced the YouTube algorithm, and yet we're still no closer to understanding, uncovering what's going on here. The video is pretty short and sweet, but I doubt you'll actually be able to finish it. It's a mannequin looking android named Tara singing her little song for the camera. Now she's got the chutzpah down pat, but her natural stage presence could use a little bit of work, maybe her tone too, because she kind of sings discordantly and completely terrifying. It, it sounds like the kind of thing that you would hear a few minutes before you wake up strapped to an ice cold slab operating table in a dank basement. The robot, we know, was built by John Bergeron, and that's about all we know. He envisioned his beloved Tara as being an android pop sensation, kind of like what I think Grimes might be. And I really don't want to shut down Tara's career before it's blossom, but she's got some serious hurdles to solve first. The incredibly unsettling nature of the video caused speculators to run wild with theories about what they were seeing. The most extreme ones go so far as to suggest John was a murderer, and Tara was a mannequin wearing the clothes of his victims. Some suggest he's just a very strange man who wanted a singing companion in his home. In all the years since this clip went viral, we've never got a follow-up on this bizarre video, and I doubt we're ever going to get more answers on this one. I wonder if Tara is still out there, if she's still singing proudly, or if she's rotting in a basement somewhere. I just hope she's still practicing, you know? Number 3. Croatian Stalker Do you ever feel like someone might be watching you? I know I do quite a lot, although it could be because someone is watching me right now, you're watching me right now, but I also just mean in my day to day. It's spine chilling to imagine that somebody's following you without you realizing for gosh knows what and, and trailing you around, preventing you from feeling safe. This next video, appropriately and concisely titled Croatian Stalking Tape, is a footage of two men recording themselves being pursued by a masked stranger. And according to the uploader, this was the last time either of them were ever seen. The video was uploaded not by anyone in the video, but rather a third party who somehow got a hold of it. And the only evidence we can find for it is that he claims it was recorded in 2005 and is a piece of evidence and a missing persons case for these two individuals. In the video, we can clearly see the two friends uh, initially enjoying a night on the town together when they're apprehended by a very strange man wearing a sack over his head. You know, normal stuff. At first, the sack clad man appears, well, I don't want to say friendly per se, but he's not outwardly hostile just bizarre. Slouching and bending and walking in a way that kind of intones that either it's not a human or it's a human who's had a really long night. The two friends then try their best to elude the pursuer, who does not seem keen on letting them go. 
They try to lose him by making their way to a hotel lobby, where they proceed to call for an elevator to try and find some respite from their stalker, only for the elevator door to open and show them the last thing they could have ever wanted to see, as they are face to face with the sack man and the doors close. If the video uploader is to be believed, this could really be the last thing they ever saw. It was hard to try and find any more information about this video. I did some digging, but I couldn't get any solid answers as to where this came from, who these people were, and if they really went missing. There's some speculation that it could be a very elaborate fake, which is always a possibility. Let me know if anybody's got any intel on this one. Number two, video dating. Hey, dating is hard. We've all been there. Let me tell you, since that Dahmer show dropped on Netflix, it's not been easy for me. In today's world, it can be so hard to meet that perfect match, especially if you're on the brink of sanity. Uh, this video, uploaded and titled Video Dating Tape, was allegedly found in the VCR purchased at a car boot sale, which if you're not familiar with that term, it's kind of like an English flea market where you sell stuff out of your cars. The VHS is a low quality clip of someone, innocently enough, trying to prevent themselves for a video dating service. It starts with a 36 year old man, Tony, kind of awkwardly explaining what he's all about. You know how they go. We've all been there. Where it starts to get unsettling though is the discordant screaming that we can hear in the background. And the guy in the video seems like he's mentally degrading very fast. Someone that can... He starts smacking himself in the head in frustration, tripping over his words, and accidentally revealing probably a lot more than he means to. Especially when he starts to say funny, flirty little things like, I'm looking for someone who doesn't mind disappearing for a long time, and cute little sweet nothings like, I'm looking for someone who likes a long walk on the beach, and someone I can spend the rest of their life with. Now the video is almost too perfect, you know? And the only thing that makes you wonder if maybe it's not a fake is just how convincingly creepy this 36 year old bachelor is acting. If anyone has got some answers for this one, please let me know because this one really did send a chill down my spine trying to watch it. And hey, if anyone wants, at the end of the video, Tony left his address if you'd like to reach out to him, if you like pina coladas getting caught in the rain and want to spend the rest of your life with him. Number one, Sad Satan. Sad Satan is a deeply mysterious lost video game allegedly emanating from the dark web and it's wrapped in intrigue and controversy and has all the makings of a great classic internet urban legend. The game first came into the mainstream when the owner of the now defunct obscure horror corner YouTube channel was sent a link to this strange game with the sender saying that they found it on a deep web page where users could post random files. The actual game's contents are deeply disturbing and unsettling. It truly feels like something you were never meant to see. There's not a whole lot of depth to the gameplay. It just features the player wandering down maze after maze of monochromatic hallways. A strange audio plays all around you from all sorts of sources like uh, an old Swedish number station, disembodied, blood-curdling screams. In some versions of the game, there are enemies that appear to be ghostly children figures standing in the maze with you. Images flash repeatedly through the gameplay, featuring pictures of notorious criminals, audio from recordings of criminals like Charles Manson can be heard and seen. The game ends rather abruptly. If you run into any of the haunted children in the game, they'll end you and the game will be over. The mystery behind Sad Satan is arguably bigger than the game itself. Where did it come from? To date, no one truly knows who developed it, or, or why, or, or what their intentions even were. After the game became big, thanks to the obscure horror corner, there was a drove of interest in the game, leading to sinister double copies being passed around online masquerading as the real one. And these variants would include things like illegal content inside the game, or dangerous malware, as users had reported that their computers would act sluggish, or even outright shut down irreversibly after downloading the widely released copy. The obscure horror channel shut down after Sad Satan started to get attention, leading to a ton of speculation there. Was the original uploader of the video the creator of the game and he was trying to garner some sort of viral reputation for it? Or did he feel some sort of guilt or responsibility for getting this game out into the mainstream? It's been years and we're still no closer to getting any of the answers on this. Number 5, Spree. Coming in first on our list is the newest release and a new age classic that I think give it a few years will get the recognition, Spree. It was called American Psycho for the digital age and I think that fits. Spree stars Joe Keery of Stranger Things and Joe fame, putting down the baseball bat and the hair gel and sitting behind the wheel of a rideshare service, playing a down on his luck young man named Kurt who wants nothing more than to be a viral famous social media. Media star. Ah, 
very relatable. But in a sea of unboxing videos, react TikToks, let's plays, confession videos, hashtag challenges, apologies, and top five videos about horror movies, Kurt struggles to find any sort of audience for his content whatsoever and decides that the best way to stand out on the internet is to live stream himself snuffing his passengers he picks up in his rideshare app. Okay, you know, to each each their own. I'll stick to doing YouTube videos. You do you. Now, Spree is not the smartest movie out there. The social satire is a little basic, to be honest, and it could have done with a lot more fleshing out on its commentary on social media addiction and internet validation, but it makes for a very solid foundation for a flick. It's got a plot that probably would have made for an okay Black Mirror episode, and maybe this movie wouldn't have worked as well if it wasn't for how fun Joe Keery is. Maybe I'm extremely biased because I love the guy, and because like most of the Western world, Steve Harrington is the only reason I watch Stranger Things, but he brings a super fun mania to the social media addicted lunatic. The American Psycho comparison, definitely apt. That's one of my absolute favorite movies of all time for just how sick and like entertainingly evil Patrick Bateman is. You know he's the most reprehensible, unlikable character ever put to film, but Christian Bale is just so damn charismatic you love him. And that's what's happening here. Joe Keery somehow manages to be both convincing as a really scary psychopath, but also oddly sympathetic and earnest. You know, it, it's the desperate have you ever seen a man soaked head to toe in blood, shaking and quivering after doing something unspeakable and he's still asking you to subscribe to his channel? And speaking of vapid, deranged, dead-eyed internet personalities looking for fame, if you're looking for more scary movie reviews, ghosts, goblins, and aliens, well click through to Top 5 Scary and subscribe. We've got loads more content with me behind the wheel, but not really, I, I can't drive. Look at me, I just skate. Number 4, VHS. VHS eventually exploded into a mega hit franchise. I think there's like five or six of them, not even including spin-offs, but it all comes back to the daring original. VHS was a collection of horror movie shorts, all under the same theme of bizarre found footage horror, and the result is electric. It's like getting to sit at home for your own private horror movie film festival. Now, the collections of shorts featured were all directed by, at the time, fairly underground independent horror movie directors, but now looking back at it, it's like they've assembled a really impressive pantheon of rising horror legend. We got stuff from Adder Wingard, who gave us Year Next in the 2016 Blair Witch reboot, which was okay. We got one from David Bruckner, who would go on to direct The Ritual in the 2022 Hellraiser. And we've got T.I. West, who would make the A24 Darling Pearl. So it's a film with nothing but wall-to-wall -wall talent and creativity at their best. It also made the format of being an anthology movie like part of the plot of the movie itself, which I thought was very meta and juicy. A group of career crooks filmed themselves committing violent and vile acts, and hey, I wonder if they knew the guy from the first movie. Movie, and they are commissioned to heist a single object, a mysterious VHS tape. The guys break into the house and find the tape, and the movie is them watching it and then cutting back to whatever strange mystery is happening with the criminals. It's very inventive, it's very immersive, it's very, very cool. Now, all the segments are really cool, but I want to shout out the shorts Tuesday the 17th for being a very high concept idea for a horror movie. I can't say I've seen elsewhere, and I can't even say too much about giving it away, but it uses the VHS format really fun. And another shout out for Something Strange Happened to Emily when she was younger. Again, Again, very inventive. It's told exclusively through video calls and the internet, and it features a hearty dose of medical body horror, wild twists, and just like like the tiniest little bit of alien stuff. Just like a little bit. Number three, Lake Mungo. Okay, let's go back to another lesser known one with Lake Mungo. This one's an Australian feature, came out around 2008. Lake Mungo is a healthy, hearty dose of scares and thrills and heart-wrenching family drama. Horror and family drama go hand in hand like the girl from Hereditary and a stop sign. Too soon? That was too far? That was too far? That was too far. In Lake Mungo, we're in the perspective of Matthew Palmer, a young man who has been depressed and broken shortly after his sister's drowning shattered his family's well-being and mental health. However, Matthew begins to see signs of his sister everywhere, feeling her presence in the house with him, and mostly because he keeps seeing her ghost all around. He sets up a surveillance camera system all over their house and begins making a documentary about his experience hunting for his sister and closure. As the investigation as to whether or not his sister really is haunting them, Matthew ends up uncovering family secrets that were long thought buried and finds himself haunted by his sister's loss in a way much grander than any ghost story could. Now what I really like about this one is pretty much right up until credits, you'll be asking yourself what's happening.
happening. Not in a confusing way, like an Inception sort of thing. It's just got a bunch of fun and clever twists that kind of keep you guessing the entire film, keep you asking questions. The film uses the medium well. It allows the audience to go on this journey with the family, where you're there with them and you're asking too what's happening, if it's really a haunting or if it's all just a sad family wanting to see their daughter one last time. It honestly ends up being really heartwarming in a bizarre way. You don't see a lot of horror movies that kind of get you right here. And without spoiling like too, too much, because I do want you to see it, unlike Hereditary, this one doesn't really have like a happy ending, but it doesn't have a horrifically sad ending. It's kind of bittersweet. It's genuinely very touching. So if you're looking for something to tug at your heartstrings a lot while also making your hair stand on end, you can't go wrong with Lake Munga. Number two is Wreck. Maybe you've already seen this one because it was a smash hit commercially and critically, but if you haven't, man, come on, you really oughta. Wreck is found footage stuff at its best, putting you smack dab in the POV of the action, and it makes you feel like you're both part of this horrifying nightmare, but also kind of like you're like an FBI agent watching evidence recovered years after the fact in a dark room. Wreck follows a film crew that's recording something when they find themselves caught in a way bigger story. When a neighbor attacks someone and bites them, police quarantine off a building for an unknown reason, and you get to experience it all go down in first person as more and more people inside the building seem to be turning into something a little rabid, vicious, and more than a little undead. Wreck does zombies 28 days later style with a pretty interesting twist that I, I won't give away if you still haven't seen it. They're fast, violent, and unpredictable, and it makes for a super entertaining movie watching the protagonist try and fend off a horde of undead in these really cramped, tight, claustrophobic spaces. There's a lot of excellent choreography work going on here to make sure everything fits in the frame, and the first person view of the camera really makes it feel like you are stuck in there with them too. If you let yourself get into it, you really have a good time with this one. Like, if there was ever really a zombie apocalypse happening, I think we could all agree there'd be gigabytes worth of cell phone footage to go through. So in a bizarre way, this movie about a zombie apocalypse feels oddly realistic. Even just outside of being a good found footage horror movie, Wreck is also just a super good zombie movie if you're into that sort of thing. They remade it into quarantine for Americans a year later, but if you want my advice, skip the remake and just go for the original, and that is honestly true of like 99.9% .9 of all horror movies anyway. Okay, before we get into number one properly, I wanted to cheat a little bit and break the rules of top five. Don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody that I added some extras, but I wanted to shout out a few honorable mentions that I love that didn't make the cut. Blair Witch is gonna be the first one, the original, the sequels are all iffy. Number two is gonna be Troll Hunters, really, 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 really fun monsters, yeah. Paranormal Activity, it's pretty good. It's not super my thing, but it's pretty good. And finally, wanted to shout out Host really quick. It's about a seance that happens on Zoom, just came out, very modern. Okay, there we go. So number one on the list is gonna be Creep. It's got nothing to do with Radiohead, sorry. Coming to us from Patrick Bryce, an indie darling Mark Duplass, he takes a break from earnestly mumbling through an indie movie to play a completely chilling, well, the title said it, Creep. This movie is basically just watching Mark Duplass be really, really, really weird in front of a camera for an hour and 20 minutes. It's a great example of when you can do a lot more with a lot less. This movie is as absolutely bare bones as it gets. There's two actors in the entire movie and they're the two guys who wrote and directed the movie. A struggling videographer, Aaron, gets an offer to film a series of personal diaries for a strange client, Joseph, who has an inoperable brain tumor and wants to leave a series of videos behind for his unborn child. Which does sound nice until Aaron gets there and discovers very quickly something is really off about this and this isn't gonna be a normal job. This movie is all performance and Duplass crushes it as the bizarre, mysterious Joseph. He plays him really, like, realistically creepy. Like, he's the kind of guy you'd meet on a bus and spend the rest of the day thinking about. Like, you know something is wrong with the guy, but you're not really sure in what way and just how afraid of him and how dangerous he might be until it's too late. It's a movie that really gets in your head and gets right under your skin. If you leave the movie terrified of the main character, but also very enamored in equal measures, worry not, because Bryce and Duplass agree with you, since there's a creep too, which is apparently just as good as the first. I have I haven't seen it yet, you know, I only have so much time, but I should, should see it eventually, since there is a Creep 3 in early pre-production stages. So although this guy may be a completely unsettling weirdo, we love this creep and can't get enough. He belongs here. Number five on this list is the alien baby. This is a clip of what looks like an alien child. We know how the government is with aliens and anything extraterrestrial, so it's clear why they wouldn't want the public looking at something like this too closely. I mean, they don't let any anyone in on anything happening in any of their secret bases, so it makes sense they wouldn't want us watching a video like something like this. Let's show 30 seconds of this clip and you guys comment down below what the heck this thing is. Now, how are you feeling? Dad. You feeling okay? You feel well? Dad. 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 Dad.
Can I get you something? Do you want a glass of water? We're not really getting anywhere, are we, at the moment? Are you seeing something? Is there something you see over there? So, very clearly, that is not a human child. Now, it's possible that could be an animal of some kind, but I have no idea what type of animal looks like that. That's why, if I had to guess, we're looking at some type of alien creature. This is a really interesting find because it means that aliens might have children similar to how we have children. Obviously, we don't know the process to how this baby came about, but the idea that aliens aliens grow like we grow. That's important information because for a long time people have speculated on their reproductive process. To just assume that they grow like we grow would be ignorant on our part, but now this looks like some serious evidence. What I want to see though is a clip of this creature several years from now. What does this thing look like then? It doesn't look too threatening today, but you already know that it's going to turn into something deadly, most likely. Number four on this list is the dinosaurs. This next clip was initially from Shortest Blockbusters, but was broken down by Chills on his channel. I'm going to play you an excerpt of what he has to say right now. Do you believe that some extraterrestrials are living among us? Then you really got to see this scary video. The footage shows two dinosaur looking creatures scurrying across a frozen river. They have spines that are heightened, long tails and pointed heads, otherwise their bodies look more or less huge. Human. Are these dinosaurs, extraterrestrials, humanoids? And that is the big question, right guys? Aliens, dinosaurs, or humanoids? What the heck are they? He goes on in that video to talk about how he believed this was actually VFX, but some people in the comments weren't too sure. VFX could easily be the explanation, but it could also be used as an excuse. The government has chalked a lot of things up to VFX and CGI before, and some of that has turned out to be real, so why can't this? Aliens living among us, or other creatures living among us, has been talked about and rumored for a long time. We have had no definitive proof, but videos like this just keep getting released with no explanation. I wouldn't be surprised if in a few years time, some real proof finally surfaces confirming a lot of our suspicions about these creatures. Number three on this list is the river creature. This next video was released back in 2015 and shows a bunch of people wearing hazmat suits picking a strange looking creature out of a river. This was apparently captured in Poland and there was no official report on this when it came out. So as we can see, there is a bunch of people with hazmat suits picking up this weird creature from the river. What is that creature and why do they need to be wearing these hazmat suits for? So they handed off to some other people in different colored hazmat suits and then walked to a place where presumably the person filming can't go. I also wouldn't be surprised if the person filming was already in a spot where they weren't allowed to be and just snuck in anyways. Maybe this is in some secret base of some kind where experiments are being performed. I mean why else would they need hazmat suits? Definitely a very strange one there guys. Comment down below if you have any idea what they were doing here and what that thing was. Number two on this list is the creepy mermaid. So I always thought that I would want to meet a mermaid, but if this is what they look like, then I definitely don't have any interest in that anymore. We're gonna see a clip from a video here that was posted back in 2018. It looks to be of a docking area somewhere and has an incredibly scary creature lying across the dock.
So what the hell was that thing, guys? That is one messed up creature that is hanging around there. Maybe it got scared off by the camera and decided that it wanted to head back in the water after it spotted the person filming it. It had a tail kind of like a mermaid, but at the same time, there wasn't really anything human about this thing, so maybe it isn't connected to that at all. But if it isn't a mer person, then what sort of creature could this thing be and why haven't we heard more about it? You have to imagine that if creatures like this are swimming around our waters, that the government, they'd be aware of this, but they haven't said anything about it at all. Who knows how many creepy things are in our oceans that we don't know about. And number one on this list is the creepy creature. The video that I'm going to show you was uploaded by Keenan Music to YouTube on May 7th, 2021. It's a very short clip, only 15 seconds long, of someone investigating Japan using Google Earth and discovering something super creepy and weird. An unexplained object is going to be flying flying in the sky over top of a Japanese city. Let's roll the clip now. That thing almost looks like a drone, but it also looks like it could be made from organic material. I also don't know of any drones that look like that that are constructed by humans. Could this be something from another planet that made its way to Earth undetected and is scoping out our world? I think everything is on the table with something like this and some investigation desperately needs to get done. Comment down below what you think this could be and why nothing official has been released on it yet. Number five, the Roswell autopsy. Perhaps one of the most famous pieces of lost alien footage is the infamous Roswell autopsy tape. Maybe you've heard of it. If you're a UFO enthusiast like me, no doubt it's come up before at some point. Roswell was kind of the birthplace of UFO mania, where a lot of the first conspiracy theories and a lot of the public ideas we have about aliens really stem from. If you don't know somehow, the story goes that an alien craft crash landed in Roswell, New Mexico, where it was swiftly apprehended by shadowy government agents looking to pull a curtain over the whole thing. Reverse engineered, studied, down to the pilot of the craft, recovered by FBI scientists. Almost immediately after, hushed whispers and rumors of a recorded alien autopsy set conspiracists and enthusiasts mind ablaze in equal measures. Recorded footage of an alien body being dissected would be undeniable proof with world shattering consequences and would probably make for some pretty good ratings. Well the Fox network would agree with you because in 1995 the footage was broadcasted on Fox presented by legendary thespian and number one guy to trust in regards to human alien relations one Jonathan Frakes. The film broadcast was not the true footage of the autopsy, but rather a high budget recreation to show for a wider public audience what had happened. The director claims he had seen the original footage from the 1947 autopsy, but couldn't release it. He claims that he spliced shots from the original footage into the faked footage to provide some clarity, but didn't tell us what was real and what wasn't. And he insists that the video wasn't faked, but rather a reconstruction for educational purposes. Now, despite only being a reenactment, the special effects of the footage are remarkable. It does look pretty believable. It was helmed by industry legend Stan Winston, the special effects warlock responsible for bringing the predator and the aliens alike. The alien body in the footage was filled with sheep guts, chicken entrails, pig knuckles, and raspberry jam to create the illusion of an alien filled to bursting with foreign organs and probably tasted halfway decent with a little bit of soy sauce. So was the footage ever actually real or was it all just cooked up to sweep up viewers on a dwindling TV season? The director maintains always that what he saw was real, he just wasn't allowed to show it and did his best to show us what happened. There's an interesting discussion to be had there, I think. Was he just showing how easy it is to fraud something, manipulate people into believing whatever they see? Who's to say if the true footage ever did come out? We would even believe it. We would probably just dismiss it the exact same way. But if you want to see way more scary footage, real or not, dismissible or provable, we have got loads and loads of that for you to enjoy. So click through, stay a while, and get scared all night long with Top 5 Scary. I'll be here the whole night and in this building. Number 4, Edgar Mitchell. The thing about most alien sightings is that they don't always come come from the most reputable of sources. You know, it's usually a random internet post, maybe a blurry shot from an iPhone kind of thing posted on Reddit with a caption like, what is this? Or, you know, it's somebody who was walking home late at night and saw some lights in the sky and didn't know it was a plane. And while I think we should respect the voice of the people and the common man, it'd be nice if we got someone with a little bit of clout to their name. Well, luckily we've got more than a few astronauts who've seen bizarre things up there and are willing to share their stories. Edgar
Edgar Mitchell is one such man. He stood on the face of the moon before. He helped save the Apollo 14 mission from becoming a disaster. He's the sixth man to ever walk on the moon, and he is a lifelong defender and believer in aliens and UFOs. Mitchell claims that he's seen things that prove existence of life outside the planet. First and foremost, he is a firm believer of the Roswell conspiracy, and he insists that all those stories are true and that the military has been hiding the truth behind what happened at Roswell for decades. Adding on to say that it was buried, and the military propagated a covert movement to discredit everything that had happened at Roswell, to deter people from taking any news about UFOs and flying saucers seriously, dismissing it forever as tinfoil hat stuff. Mitchell claims that NASA believes the public wouldn't be able to handle the truth. Come on, we're ready. We're ready, we're all ready, we're big enough now to know the truth. It's like the tooth fairy, we're grown up, we know where the quarters are coming from, just tell us. And Edgar Mitchell's been trying to just tell us. In 2004, Edgar Mitchell told a Florida newspaper that he knew there was a secret cabal inside the American government that took in and studied alien corpses. And that after JFK was removed from office, the group did not answer to the president and didn't include the commander in chief in their briefings. He was quoted saying, they all know that UFOs are real. The question is where they are coming from. A shot how do we organization existing outside the president's control with insider knowledge on aliens and trying to suppress the public? Did Mr. Mitchell just casually confirm the men in black are real? Now NASA themselves obviously denied all of Mitchell's statements, but obviously they would. What government is going to throw their hands up and admit that they have been slicing up alien bodies on the side? Number 3. The First Flying Saucer Now while the Roswell, New Mexico incident was the UFO sighting that really shot alien sightings into the mainstream public consciousness and kind of defined what alien sightings look like, you know, the idea of little gray or green men and flying saucers. It was obviously far from the first alien sighting ever recorded, just kind of the most popular. But not even a few weeks earlier, there was actually another famous sighting, and one that's thought to be the progenitor for sightings of UFOs being thought of as flying saucers. Kenneth Arnold was an American aviator. Unlike most UFO sightings, Kenneth never changed his story once, never made any kind of surrealist, outrageous claims, and stuck to the same story for the rest of of his life. He saw weird saucers in the air he couldn't explain. Well, let's take a listen. It was 1947, June the 24th, weeks before Roswell, which occurred in July 1947. Mr. Arnold was flying his private plane over Washington by Mount Rainier. Rainier, I, I've never been to Washington, so you guys gotta forgive me. He was looking for a recently downed transport plane that had a $5,000 bounty the US military was offering in exchange for its finding. As he was approaching the summit, Arnold noticed that he saw nine blinding flashes of light hovering up above. When looking in closer, they resembled ships but looked like discs. Arnold said that he saw them flying in a bizarre pattern, with each position diagonally together, reporting that it reminded him of the tail of a kite. Arnold was an aviation expert and said that the craft seemed far more advanced than anything human beings were capable of at the time, moving at unbelievable speeds. He landed at a nearby airport and told crew that he saw something bizarre he couldn't rationalize, worried that perhaps it could have been missiles being fired at Washington. Reporters interviewed him and he was pressed for several questions, but no one could corroborate or figure out just exactly what it was he had seen. Arnold was questioned by the army as well, who took his claims remarkably seriously, as he was a fairly respected and reputable man, and there wasn't really the same culture surrounding aliens and UFOs, and as such, his claim was met with genuine worry. No one ever figured it out, but the story of them being saucers, combined with a saucer seen in New Mexico, led to the public perception of UFOs picturing them as saucers for the better part of 60 years, pretty much to this day. Number 2. The Travis Walton Abduction Now abduction stories can sometimes be a little much to believe, even for those with the most open minds who want to believe. You know, they all seem kind of the same. It's somebody you maybe can't trust driving home late at night, saw something strange, they woke up in a blinding light room and they got poked and prodded by little gray men. Well, Travis Walton's story is not dissimilar to that. It's pretty out there even by abduction standards, but it's too juicy to pass up. So pop open those ears. In 1975, Travis Walton was working as a logger and was facing a fairly routine day. Six other loggers and him driving around in the forest when they saw something incredibly bright shining at them through the treetops. One of the men claimed it looked like a flattened disc, a saucer of sorts even. Walton stepped out of the bed of the truck to investigate and was struck by some invisible force that knocked him backwards. The rest of the crew panicked and drove away. Huge faux pas, I'll say, leaving 
leaving your coworker behind after being struck by an alien, but okay, you think you know somebody. When the crew returned, Walton had vanished. Walton awoke and had thought that he'd been taken to a hospital because he'd found himself in a blindingly bright room and could hear people moving around him. But it wasn't until he got a good look at his doctors that he knew something was amiss. Three feet tall, with brown, quarter sized pupils, with marshmallow like skin. Walton freaked out, obviously, as one would probably do, and was swiftly restrained by his captors. He tried to fight them off, but was greeted by a tall creature he said resembled a humanoid, but was masked by an intimidating helmet, a kind of Darth Vader looking thing. The masked creature took Walton and escorted him back into the operating room and put a translucent mask over his face. And Walton drifted out of consciousness again, unsure if anything was real. The next thing he remembers is walking alongside a highway as if nothing had ever happened. He eventually finds his way to a phone and called his brother-in-law, who panically asked what had happened. It turned out that Walton had been gone for five days, and he was untraceable. Search parties had formed looking for him, sent dogs and choppers, tracked him from the woods, but no one could find any sign of him, as if he'd blinked out of existence and then blinked right back. Travis swore what happened to him was real, a real abduction, and he's maintained that story ever since that fateful week in 1975. Now, if you think this story is fascinating and you're upset that nobody recorded any of it and there wasn't any footage of what Travis described, well, the tragic news is, yeah, it doesn't exist. You can, however, watch a 90s sci-fi movie that is directly based off Travis's case called Fire in the Sky. I've never seen it, but I'm sure it's on Amazon Prime or something. It's got uh, got Robert Patrick from Terminator 2. He's in it. He's a good actor. Yeah, check it out. And number one, the Rendlesham Forest incident. The incident and conspiracy at Roswell, New Mexico is one of the most famous events in UFO culture. This incident is considered England's Roswell, the Rendlesham Forest incident. Few other alien sightings can boast this many government witnesses, memos, and strange proof. Let's paint the scene. It was December 26, 1980. Oh, nice and festive and Christmas themed. Surrounding Rendlesham Forest in Suffolk, England was a series of Air Force bases and US Army personnel. Two of these stationed officers were John Burroughs and Jim Penniston. On this fateful night, the two of them were concerned by shining bright lights that were seen flying above the base, worrying that it could perhaps have been a threat or a spy plane scouting out their location. Burroughs said that he thought the lights looked like a beacon summoning people over. And over 40 people on the base all agreed, reporting seeing the lights and sharing their concern. So the two men were sent over to Rendlesham Forest to investigate. In their official document, the two men claimed that they had seen a strange, shining, triangular object that was pulsing with colored lights. Neither of the men recognized it as an aircraft from any military across the globe. The craft had seemed far too advanced for anything of this world, black and made out of a smooth, opaque glass. It didn't appear to have any wings or landing gear or even really any methods of propulsion or exhaust. The men describe it as covered in hieroglyphic-like symbols etched onto the hull of the vessel all over. Neither of the men could identify the glyphs as anything they'd seen before. Duh, it's alien stuff. As the craft touched down, nearby animals were being driven into a frenzy, and the airman's equipment started malfunctioning, communications equipment cutting out. The two personnel could no longer call back to the base. Now, not even two days later, the Rendlesham UFO was spotted again. Two days later, the same strange lights were seen hovering above the bases surrounding Rendlesham. This time, the crews came significantly more prepared, waiting and ready for the UFO to make contact. The patrol group had found depressions in the ground, and their Geiger counters started blowing up with noise. And the group had known that they'd come across where the UFO had been, and then right on time, the patrol saw the same craft flying above overhead, disappearing into the night. Years passed, and we're still no closer to understanding just what occurred at those faithful sightings. And we may never know. Number five, I want a toy. Coming up first on our list today is going to be this creepy VHS tape uploaded to YouTube, I want a toy.mp4. It's been circulating around the net for a bit, and maybe you've actually seen it before if you've got your nose to the grindstone vis a vis scary videos like yours truly. This video was uploaded to a channel called Baddington and is said to have been discovered on a lost VHS tape and has left people with a real uneasy feeling in their stomach afterwards, and not just from watching all that static. The video itself, it's only about five minutes long. But those five minutes are more than enough to make your skin crawl and your hair stand on end. I'm burpy. The footage is grainy and distorted, making it difficult to discern what exactly it is you're even watching. It feels like a staticky nightmare, like something you kind of remember but can't quite focus on. It's like a recording of a TV show you've never heard of or seen before, aimed at what looks like preschoolers or kindergartners. There's a puppet that looks like he's probably pretty good friends with Annabelle and the puppet from Saw, and he's sitting singing his lovely, horrifying rendition of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star for you. Ah, horrifying puppets and slowed down scary nursery rhymes. 
is there a better combination in scary videos? If that wasn't enough for you though, things get a lot worse when our scary puppet friend seems to start degrading as the quality of the video degrades. His eyes vanish and the camera cuts to our little wooden pal saying how badly he wants a toy. He's been a good boy. I, I don't know. I gotta be honest, haunted puppet. I'll see what I can do, but I can't guarantee nothing. It might be best to keep a bit of distance between us, you and I. Now, if you enjoyed this kind of stuff, and I definitely do, that's why I made a list of it, I definitely recommend you toss Baddington a subscribe. They're a very good content creator. If you like content like this, there is a lot of haunted VHS stuff on that channel. But if you're looking for more than haunted VH stuff, analog or digital, Top 5 Scary has it all. From stories of hauntings, Halloween movies, cryptids, conspiracies, true crime, and more, we've got a little something to scare everybody. So hit subscribe and that bell, and don't miss a single scream. But take it slow, okay? Make sure you watch the rest of this video. Number 4, Grave Robbing for Morons. Do you wish you had a few extra bucks? A little side hustle to help you make a few dollars in between checks in these trying times? I know I do. Maybe you just need a hobby that can also make you a little money on the side, a little passive income. Maybe something fun like selling old clothes on Depop or I don't know, something outdoorsy like grave robbing. Luckily, there's an instructional video you have just got to see. That's our next entry, Grave Robbing for Morons. The video itself is a how-to guide for individuals interested in grave robbing. It provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to locate and dig up graves, as well as helpful little tips for avoiding detection by the authorities. Now, the video it does kind of seem like it might be a joke. It's presented kind of humorous, you know, there's some funny graphics and sarcastic commentary. People for a long time have wondered if the video is real, if this guy's really confessing to a criminal act, or if he's just doing a joke in poor taste. Grave robbing is definitely pretty illegal, but it's also one of those things that's considered like, I don't know, highly immoral, blasphemous, if that's your sort of thing. It's fine to grave rob if you're in like a video game and you're taking Viking gold out of an old crypt, but it's a little bit different when you're cracking open coffins in real life, I would say. Now, some people argue that the video is, it's just a work of satire, it's just a joke, and you shouldn't put too too much stock into a weird video uploaded to YouTube, and that the video might just be a commentary on the whole absurdity of grave robbing as a whole, and this is to discourage people from engaging in the practice. Regardless of whether or not you think it's real or not, it's definitely got a lot of us talking, so it's definitely a videotape that maybe none of us should have watched. Some people believe it should be banned, while others believe it should be protected. That's all I gotta say about that. Number three, the Paris Catacombs. The Paris catacombs really don't need any help being scary. It's a tunnel filled with the remains of hundreds of dead bodies and more bones hanging up than a museum. So even a well-lit guided tour with a stop for some coffee and fancy snacks would probably still leave you a little bit unnerved and scared with just a dash of heebies and jeebies. Oh, if only a nice walk through the catacombs was what I was showing you. Instead, I've got a terrifying video of someone running around the catacombs like they're a first person horror game. Now, why is someone running through the catacombs? Are they running from something that's behind them? Running in the world's worst marathon? Are they just scared because they're lost and they're desperately trying to find their way to the exit? The camera gets a lot shakier as the video keeps going and the person seems like they're running faster and faster and getting more and more stressed and scared as they try to find their way out of the never ending wet, dark, dank annals of the tunnels below. At the end of the video, the camera drops and footsteps are all you can hear. So we have no idea what happened to our first person view recording. Now, someone in the comments pointed out that something to keep in mind is that even just on the map presented of the catacombs, you can go from one side of the catacombs all the way to the other. Now, a lot of the public tour is blocked off, but there are spots where you can leave the path and wander into the depths of the catacombs. And they do not advise you to do this. In fact, they would rather prefer that you do not. You can get yourself really lost. Parisian police seal every entrance they find that isn't supposed to be on the tour, which means potentially you could go into one entrance, come back and find yourself in a sealed entrance, and you can do this for miles and miles. Explorers who are familiar with the catacombs say that the depths aren't even slightly mapped out. So there are miles and miles of just unknown catacomb out there. There are ways down no one knows and paths that could lead who knows where. Just hope you're not claustrophobic. Claustrophobia. Number two, Candle Cove. If you're really tuned into internet horror and 
creepy campfire stories for a digital age, then perhaps you've come across Candle Cove before. This freaky story in particular actually scared me to my core when I was younger, like really chilled my bones. So it feels very appropriate if I can traumatize a new generation. I love to give back. What can I say? I love to keep the cycle. The legend goes that Candle Cove was a TV show for younger audiences about pirates, my favorite subject. Filmed as a puppet show like something like the Thunderbirds. It first popped up on a forum for nostalgic TV where someone asked if anybody remembered this old show Candle Cove. Tons of users came out of the woodwork to share their stories and happy memories of the silly little show. It was like a group effort. Everybody tossing in what little bits of trivia they remembered. But people were frustrated that it was hard to find any footage or like DVD recordings of the show. Well, someone uploaded a clip of Candle Cove and it is pretty darn unsettling. As I've already mentioned, puppets are inherently terrifying and then you mix in some VHS artifacts scratching and screaming and something that's supposed to be innocent turns into a horror show real quick. A lot of the details about the show sound like it was way too scary for its young audience. There's a character named Skin Taker, a skeleton pirate wearing skin, or an episode that was just the puppets shaking and screaming into the camera. Now. Where the legend of Candle Cove gets downright horrifying and freaky is that someone in the original forum thread where it was first discovered returned to the post saying that he met up with his parents and he had asked if they knew anything about Candle Cove or remembered how much he used to love that show. And he was told by his mother she was always confused whenever he would talk about that pirate puppet show since whenever he'd say he was watching it, he was just sitting by the TV watching static. Oh, I, still, still to this day, sends a little chill up my spine. They eventually actually adapted the uh, the story of Candle Cove into a TV show. I can't remember what the name of it's called, so I probably shouldn't even have included this fucking right now. Maybe done some research. Got all of that. <laughs> I am who I am. Number one, Skinnamarinka Dinka Dink. This next one is short and sweet and also came out of Baddington's channel. Two shout outs in one video. Wow, we're gonna have to cut this guy a check. Well, when you're making some of the best scary VHS content out on the web, you can expect more than one shout out in a video. This video is very short but spooky. Inspired by the sleeper indie horror hit Skinnamarink, this short video focuses in on an animatronic bear, one that I'm sure fans of indie horror PC games will instantly recognize. Much like the movie Skinnamarink, the clip really lets the tension and horror build up before unleashing a torrent of jump scares on you and then fading out on a blurry, out of focus image of the bear from before, lingering on you and staring right into your soul. And I don't know when else I'll get a public platform for this, but please watch Skinnamarink if you like this sort of thing. If you like spooky VHS horror, that's literally what the whole movie is. And it's a Canadian indie horror movie, so by Canadian content, regulations, I have to mention it. Number six, the bonus haunted video. I know, I know, a sixth entry on top five scary. What is he doing? He's letting the power go to his head. I know this is top five, but I found a sixth one and it was just too good not to include. The story about it was amazing. The footage itself is horrifying and I think you'll agree with me for including it. If you found a videotape that had a mysterious blank label reading surprise, would you watch it? I feel like a lifetime of studying horror films has prepared me to know better than to do anything so stupid. Well, in 2018, a software engineer named Foon Turin discovered a mysterious VHS tape in a charity shop in Milpitas, California. The tape looked old, definitely a few decades at least, with a worn out sticker on the front reading surprise and a smiley face looking like a prop out of a horror movie. It looked like the thing that has the girl from the ring on it. Most of us probably would have chucked that into a dumpster and set it on fire, but Foon is braver than most of us, took the tape home and popped it into an old VHS player. We got the footage and I'm gonna warn you, there's a reason I saved this for the end. Please don't write the channel and complain if this was too much for you. It's pretty disturbing. <laughs> Number five, The Blair Witch Project. I remember seeing this when I was like 10, and I'm not gonna lie, it kinda scared the shit out of me. It still does. It tripped me out, cause like back then my parents were like, oh don't worry honey, this is made up after like every scary movie we watched. But this time they were like, was that real? You know, my dad just sat there quiet thinking. I, I, I was scared. Cause the whole production apparently did such an amazing job from top to tail of its release, making the audience still feel like it really happened. The Blair Witch Project is probably the most famous found footage movie ever made. 
The campaign tactic was that the viewers were told through missing persons posters and that the characters were missing while researching in the woods for this mythical Blair Witch. Their IMDb page even listed the actors as missing and presumed deceased in the first year of the film's release. Even the film's website contained actors posing as investigators giving testimonies about their evidence. They even shared childhood photos of the three leads to add a sense of realism. By August 1999, the website had received 160 million hits and the movie went from a flop at midnight to the top worldwide. During screenings, the filmmakers made advertising efforts to promote the events in the film as factual, including the distribution of flyers at all of the film festivals such as Sundance and Cons, asking viewers to come forward with any information about the missing students. All the actors making their feature film debuts as well were described as missing and presumed dead. The actors' parents even started receiving condolence calls and sympathy letters. The actors got to witness the movie blow up but they weren't even invited to the screenings due to the publicity. Imagine not being able to go see your own premiere or even really celebrate your huge role in this huge successful movie. It's kind of sad for the actors, don't you think? I think it is. Number four, The Bay. Of course, if you like what we do here on Top 5 Scary, throw us a thumbs up down below or comment which one of these real-ish movies scared you the most. The Bay is a 2012 American mockumentary horror film directed by Barry Levinson and written by Michael Wallach. The movie's basically about a small town getting infected with a contaminated water source that two oceanographers discovered in the bay without saying anything. After investigating fish being eaten from the inside out, they realize that the culprit is this tongue-eating louse creature that looks like the bugs from like Starship Troopers. Yeah, really scary. The movie came out as a result of a documentary Levinson was asked to produce about real problems facing the Chesapeake Bay. Although Levinson chose to abandon the documentary upon learning that it was already being covered by a huge news network organization. Levinson instead decided to use all that research to produce this horror film, which he hoped would shed light on the issues facing Chesapeake Bay. As such, when promoting the film, he noted that more than 80% of the film is real and actually factual information. Also, 80% is so real that it had to wait to be released and cleared first. Uh, what? Yeah, this was like a real issue, hence the confusion around the found footage. Apparently this nuclear disaster monster giant isopod in the bay aren't real, but the small isopods filmed are very real. You see a tight shot of the isopod, Levinson said. That's not CGI, that's real. We just pulled that out of the Atlantic Ocean. The isopods do this really gruesome thing, which the bay does a great example of, is that they eat the fish from inside out. All that stuff is actually factual. A leaking nuclear reactor actually does have a runoff heading towards the Chesapeake Bay. Its quantities aren't great, but the fact that it's actually happening seems scary enough. The chicken farm runoff stuff is actually factual too. At the end of the day, yes, it's a movie, not a documentary, but it's infused with a lot of things that are really real. I think it adds to the nature of the piece, end quote. Hey, spoken like a true artist. And that's why the film has gotten so many great reviews. Give it a watch, very spooky, very well done. Number three, the Poughkeepsie Tapes. Writer-director Fam Jam duo John Eric and Drew Dowdle are best known for their sinister yet impeccable found footage movies. Yeah, it's pretty gory and actually had to wait 10 years before being released due to the graphic footage on it. It's rumored that it was held for 10 years due to its contents and disturbing atmosphere, referring to it as a banned movie. It's likely that MGM felt audiences weren't really ready to see such graphic contents. In an abandoned house in Poughkeepsie, New York, murder investigators uncover hundreds of tapes showing decades of a deranged killer's work. And in an all too realistic found footage mockumentary, the moments showing the killer POV are things of nightmares. I'm not gonna lie, this is like the goriest movie on our list today. But with scary movies, sometimes comes a little gore, you know? The Poughkeepsie Tapes plays out as a faux documentary following the discovery of a very large collection of VHS tapes created by said deranged psychopath and the investigations that follow. The documentary is well shot and played out in a believable manner. Sometimes the acting is a little, yeah, this is really fake. And then sometimes it's like, Okay, I'm gonna look up if that guy's a real cop. The feel of this movie is gore, gore, gore. If you're into like Saw type stuff and multiple victims and lots of popcorn syrup, this one's definitely for you. These tapes are only fictional, but there's a small catch. According to Marist College, the Poughkeepsie tapes may be based on an actual event. A killer named Kendall Francois killed eight to 10 people in Poughkeepsie in the late 90s, but didn't videotape the murders. 
There's heavy debate in the film industry on which movies are depicting actual cases similar to actual reports and acts that are totally staged and made up. Number two, The Quiet Ones. The Quiet Ones is a 2014 British supernatural horror film directed by John Pogue based on a very real 1972 parapsychology experience called The Philip Experiment conducted in Toronto. It stars Jared Harris as a UFT professor attempting to prove that poltergeists are actually real manifestations of the human psyche and not actually supernatural beings. The movie is very scary, no doubt about it. Jared Harris is amazing, as always, but the real story behind it is actually way more terrifying. The professors of mathematics, science, and psychology created a fictitious character through an attempt to communicate with said fictitious entity through a controlled seance. It was the real deal. The character created and agreed upon was named Philip during the test. His fictional backstory coincided with real historic events and places, but with multiple contradictions and errors. They said he was born in 1624 in England, had an early military career, knighted by 16, in the English Civil War, and eventually dying at the age of 30. The group was seated around a table via a lecture, with initial seances yielding no contact, no communication, and no phenomenon. The professors then dimmed the lights, fully leaned into the seance, changing the environment. Participants and students then began feeling a presence. Lots of table vibrations, breezes, unexplained voices, and sounds which matched responses to Philip's life. Audio and video and witness accounts documented the paranormal event, but Philip never actually appeared. Yo, this actually happened, like, like down the street from us. This is terrifying. And number one, Ghost Watch 1992. First broadcast on BBC One Halloween Night 1992. Written by Stephen Volk and directed by Leslie Manning, the drama was produced for an actual BBC anthology series. Despite having been recorded only weeks in advance, the narrative was presented as a live television broadcast. During and following its first and only UK television broadcast, the show resulted in an estimated 1 million separate phone calls to the BBC that night, dealing with a mixture of complaints and praise for the program's bizarre release. Yeah, Ghostwatch has never been repeated on UK television. It's been replayed on stations such as the Canadian channel Scream for Halloween once in 2004, and the Belgian channel Canvas in 2008. The hour and a half event was shot documentary style and appeared as part of the BBC. It involved actual BBC reporters performing a live on-air investigation of a so-called haunted house in London in which demonic poltergeists activity was taking place. Through found footage and interviews with family living there, they discovered the existence of a violent ghost nicknamed Pipes. A nickname from their kids. Footage actually showed the police arriving at Fox Hill Drive and the spirit even dragged a BBC host behind a door. Yeah, that is horrifying. Imagine watching your weekly hosts on like a reliable television network that's censored and archived and then all of a sudden the host just gets yanked up the wall by a supposed demon. Live on TV. The five grave encounters. Now, you guys had a lot to say about this particular film in the first part of this series, and rightly so, because, put it this way, if every episode of Most Haunted was as awesome as this, then we'd have enough content to keep us going for the next few decades. Written and directed by the Vicious Brothers, aka Colin Minahan and Stuart Ortiz, Grave Encounters is a 2011 Canadian supernatural horror film that strikes at the vein of paranormal reality TV, which, as I mentioned previously, is a much needed antidote to the fan footage genre as a whole. Whole. We as an audience need to be able to suspend our disbelief when faced with such a personal depiction of horror. Again, it strikes the question, why are they still filming? Well, this film follows Lance Preston, the charismatic host of Grave Encounters, an infamous ghost investigation TV series, and his crew as they make their way through the abandoned mental asylum, Collingwood Psychiatric Hospital. What plays out is a genuinely nerve-wracking classical ghost story. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, there's not much more to the plot other than the pursuit of the paranormal. And the the pains that come with it. But as far as that goes, Grave Encounters does it very convincingly, and it's jammed with some genuinely uneasy moments. So much so that the Vicious Brothers have extended the Grave Encounters series and developed quite the cult following in the process. Coming in next at number four, Devil's Pass. Thank you. 
Now, if you're aware of the Dyatlov Pass incident, then this film will definitely strike a chord as a terrifying adaptation of the notorious unexplained mystery. For those of you not aware with the mystery, the Dyatlov Pass incident was the unsolved death of nine ski hikers in the northern Ural Mountains in 1959 in the then former Soviet Union. To this date, their cause of death is still undetermined, and the strange occurrences surrounding the Dyatlov Pass incidents has been the imaginative spark for dozens of conspiracy theories and paranormal tales. So, as far as a horror movie goes, Devil's Pass draws from some pretty impressive source material. Directed by Rennie Harlan, the man responsible for A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, Devil's Pass follows the story of five college students who are determined to make a film about the Dyatlov mystery, and what plays out is an unnerving interpretation of the events that transpired. To be honest, if you're not a fan of conspiracy theories and government cover ups, you might feel a bit bogged down with this film, but if you are, then Devil's Pass is a sci fi horror, heart pounding ride through the found footage genre that's smartly made and surprisingly hilarious in parts. Next up at number three, Hell House LLC. What are you looking at? Holy <laughs> Got me, man. <laughs> All right, weirdo. I went into this film with zero expectations and was terrifyingly surprised at how bloody good it was. If you're a fan of the house's October built, which was featured on our first list, then you'll find all of the same tropes in Hell House, but with more emphasis on the documentary style meta world building that found footage is so well built for. This film kind of went under the radar for most people and was shipped directly to on demand services. But what's surprising about this film is how well made it is for something that was never intended to be seen on the big screen. To be honest, Hell House never really strays too far from its driving paranormal mystery and we're never fully given an explanation that diverges from the main cast perspective. But that's also why it kind of works. There's no exposition in this film at all and that's the way it should be. And it convincingly captures the feeling of the unknown. By playing out as a slow crawl that gradually unravels in media res, what we get is a genuinely terrifying paranormal mystery that if we suspend our disbelief, could just as well be real. Swinging in at number two, the taking of Deborah Logan. Hey, letting all my heat out. To be honest, this film could get on this list just for one scene in particular, and if you've seen The Taking of Deborah Logan, then you'll know exactly what scene I mean. If you've never seen this film, you've probably already seen the gif of it, because holy moly, that one's messed up. I don't say this lightly, The Taking of Deborah Logan is a really, really good horror flick, irregardless of the found footage genre. I think then that's part of the reason why it was dismissed, people were tired of the same old, same old, and as soon as they heard the phrase found footage slapped onto it, they didn't give it the chance it deserved. But what they would have found is a convincing display of found footage horror at its best. Directed and co written by Adam Robitel, The Taking of Deborah Logan follows a documentary crew who are making a research film on patients suffering from Alzheimer's. Their subject is Deborah Logan, an elderly woman with an aggressive form of the disease, but as the crew quickly realizes, that prognosis is pretty far from being correct, and there's something much more sinister at work. One of my favorite parts of this film is Gavin, who, after finding out that there's ritualistic murders involved, he just straight up quits on the spot and leaves. I love it, and we never see him again, he's just straight up gone, living his best life. Remember guys, if you ever find yourself in a horror movie situation, be more Gavin. And finally, our number one spot, the tunnel. Holy moly, this film is ridiculously good. Equal parts thoroughly entertaining, convincingly made, and just straight up terrifying. Which makes it so much more impressive then that this is essentially a fan made film, crowdfunded by selling individual digital frames for a dollar a piece. Now, I will forgive most criticisms with this film, and to be honest, if you weren't a fan of the Blair Witch Project, then in all likelihood, you won't enjoy this. It is very unforgiving with its handheld sequences, there's a lot of disorientating shots, but I don't know about you, that's exactly what I want. 
want in found footage horror. I want to feel like I've stumbled upon a tape that shouldn't be seen. It's the reason why I believe found footage horror can be so effective when it's done right. It's not entirely what we see, it's the small moments of chaos that force our imagination to fill in the gaps. On top of that, we have an extra layer of exposition from the documentary sequence, allowing us to witness how the imminent threat ahead has already affected the survivors. What we get is a terrifying display of claustrophobic horror that seriously is edge of your seat stuff. Give this one a watch and then let me know your thoughts in the comment box down below and maybe we'll have enough traction to pull off a part three. In our fifth place position, we have my favorite creepy doll, Annabelle. Back when I was in high school, I actually got to portray her in a local haunted house, which was the beginning of my scare acting career. Hey, I promise I am quite terrifying if I want to be. I promise. For those of you who might be rolling their eyes right now, I'm going to refresh memories on the real Annabelle story. So feel free to cozy up and listen. Donna and Angie were student nurses and good friends who had decided to room together while in school. And for Donna's 28th birthday, her mom had gifted her a very large Raggedy Ann doll, something she was thrilled about. Personally, I'd react the same way. Let the record know that I'm always down to accept gifts of dolls or plushies. Soon after adopting the precious doll, Donna started to notice some weird behavior. She would leave Annabelle in her bed every morning behind her locked bedroom door, seating her the same way with her arms and legs crossed, and would come home at night to Annabelle having moved rooms and in positions that weren't possible. She's described a few instances of the doll kneeling, and speaking from experience, stuffed dolls can't kneel without falling for more than a few seconds. Donna and Angie then started finding notes left throughout the apartment, written on parchment paper in red pen, two things they didn't own. When Donna's boyfriend Lou started criticizing the doll, unexplainable handprints and scratches began appearing on his body. And that's when the girls made the decision to call a priest, who then brought in the Warrens. They were able to calm down the entity enough to remove it from the home and transport her to their museum, where she resides to this day. Now, the footage I'm talking about here is from the visitors who have visited Annabelle in her current residence over the years. If you look closely, you can just see the energy that's alive in her. Also, if she was never removed from her box until like the last few years, how is she able to change position? ever so slightly from one video to the next. You tell me here. In fourth place, we have footage from a Buddhist exorcism. Known as Parita, which can be translated as protection or safeguard, it refers to the Buddhist practice of reciting certain verses and scriptures in order to ward off misfortune or danger. The practice of reciting or listening to the Parita suttas began very early in the history of Buddhism. The Mahavamsa contains the earliest historical reference to this practice, describing how Upatisa I instructed monks to recite the Ratana Sutta throughout the night during a period when Sri Lanka was afflicted by plague and diseases. In the Pali literature, these short verses are recommended by the Buddha as providing protection from certain afflictions. The belief in the effective power to heal, or protect, of the Sakakariya, or asseveration of something quite true, is an aspect of the work ascribed to the Parita. It is also widely believed that all-night recitations of Parita by monks bring safety, peace, and well-being to a community. Parita discourses can be recited at events like a funeral or on the death anniversary of a loved one, and can also be recited to placate antagonistic spirits. In 1987, Ed and Lorraine took a trip to Japan to offer their expertise in some cases that were ongoing in different parts of the country, with one of their stops being to a Buddhist temple. Describing everyone they encountered as lovely, Ed and Lorraine were shocked when they came upon not one, but two people under possession. Ed described one as being under the influence of a snake demon, as they slithered around the floor constantly, with their tongue darting in and out of their mouth. The possessed people were blindfolded, so the demons couldn't witness the rites, as the Buddhas went through the rituals and chanted around them. After the spirits were cast out, a bonfire was built to help guide them towards the afterlife. The footage we see is from a later round of prayers, which was held because one of the sets of spirits refused initially to depart from her attached soul. You can hear Lorraine attempting to guide the spirit out with the aid of a translator, coaxing Teresa to go on to the light and fly away that her family was no longer here. In third place, we have the elusive white lady of Union Graveyard. Some believe she is Harriet Seeley, whose young son passed shortly after being born, and Harriet herself passing soon afterwards. Legend believes she may have died in hopes of finding her son, and still wanders their final resting place searching him out. While others believe she is the ghost of a woman from the 1940s, who killed her husband and later herself, and is doomed to wander the graveyard. You tell me which one you believe. Her physical description is the one thing that remains consistent. She is a young woman wearing a white dress with dark hair. Thank goodness I'm not wearing white today. It seems as if she enjoys scaring the daylights out of the living, which hey, my kind of gal. Many who have witnessed her believe they have almost hit her with their vehicle, only to find no trace of her once they pull over, while others claim they have often seen her hovering slightly above the ground around the cemetery, going back and forth amongst different gravestones. 
In 1993, local firefighter Glenn Powell received a call about a transformer explosion and drove to the scene of the incident with a police officer and observed a female driver following closely behind him on the road. He remembers the night sky had turned pink, my favorite color, and the explosion emitted large amounts of electricity that had made the hair on his arm stand up at a close distance. Glenn was driving along the road beside the cemetery when the officer seated next to him yelled, Watch out! In the middle of the road was a woman with you guessed it, long brown flowing hair and wearing a white Victorian nightgown. Glenn described seeing a surprised look on her face before slamming on the brakes, but was unable to avoid hitting her, describing it like hitting a brick wall, with the back of his truck flying into the air, and the policeman next to him being launched into the dashboard. The driver behind him jumped out of the car and helped the two men search the area of the crash to check on the woman. Glenn is quoted as saying, there was no red bodily fluids, there was no clothing, there was nobody, there was nothing. Located in Connecticut, Lorraine used to often take walks through the cemetery, saying that it was one of the most haunted places around. Ed caught the white lady on camera on September 1st, 1990 at 2.40 a.m., his seventh night in a row of filming at the cemetery, determined to have footage as proof, and we can show some of that footage to you now. He described dark figures surrounding her, shapes that he said were wood ghosts that seemed to jump on her while they all argued. In second place, we have the Amityville Horror. On November 13th of 1974, Ronald DeFeo Sr., his wife, and four of their offspring, Don, Allison, Mark, and John had their lives ended by a firearm inside their home in suburban Amityville, New York. And at the time, homicide detectives claimed it was the largest number of victims in a single slang on Long Island. The deceased were found in their nightclothes and were shot in the back, apparently while they were asleep. There were no signs of a struggle inside the home, where a sign hanging outside the main entrance read, High Hopes. Sure. The killings were reported by the only surviving member of the family, the oldest son. Ronald. He told the police that he arrived at the home shortly after 6 p.m. but found the front door locked. So he crawled into the house through a window and stumbled across the icky scene. He later confessed that he had ended the lives of his family around 3.30 a.m., acting out the scenes for detectives as he described how he took out his family one by one, with the weapon eventually being found in Amityville Creek. Ronald's trial began in October of 1975. His defense attorney, William Weber, tried to make a case that the defendant, who allegedly heard voices, was innocent by reason of insanity, but the court eventually sentenced him to six current 25 year to life sentences. Try saying that five times fast. Eesh. A year later, the Lutz family moved into the now abandoned home, and that's where this goes from simply tragic to much, much more. Most of the DeFeo family's furniture was still in the house because it was included for $400 as part of the deal. Eh, you know what, I'd take that deal too. A friend of George Lutz, the father of the family, had learned about the history of the house and insisted on having it blessed. And at the time, George was a non-practicing Methodist and had no experience of what this would entail. Kathy, the mom, was a non-practicing Catholic and explained the process to him. George knew a Catholic priest named Father Mancuso who agreed to carry out the house blessing. He arrived to perform the blessing while George and Kathy were unpacking their belongings on the afternoon of December 18th, 1975, and went into the home to carry out the rites. When he flicked the first amount of holy water and began to pray, he heard a masculine voice demand that he get out. When leaving the house, the priest did not mention this incident to either George or Kathy until December 24th, when he called George and advised him to stay out of the second floor room where he had heard the mysterious voice, which happened to be the former bedroom of Mark and John DeFeo that Kathy had planned to use as a sewing room, but the call was cut short by static. Following his visit to the house, the father allegedly developed a high fever and blisters on his hands, similar to stigmata. At first, George and Kathy experienced nothing unusual in the house, but the horrors that happened over the next 28 days were awful for the Lutz family, bearing witness to slime pouring out of their walls, strange odors throughout the home, and George would wake up at 3.15 every morning, which is right around the time Ron DeFeo carried out his original crimes. A garage door would open and close on its own, an invisible spirit knocked a knife down in the kitchen, a pig-like creature with red eyes was reported staring at George and his son Daniel through a window, also Kathy and two of her children experienced bouts of levitation while trying to sleep. The footage we have from this heinous month is of a boy with glowing eyes, believed to be the spirit of the late John DeFeo. By mid-January of 1976, after another attempt at a house blessing by George and Kathy, they experienced what would be their final night in the house. Now, the Lutzes were never able to give a full account of the events that took place on this occasion, describing them as too frightening. After getting in touch with Father Mancuso, the Lutzes decided to take some belongings and stay at Kathy's mother's house in nearby Deer Park, New York, until they had sorted out the problems with the house. They claimed the phenomena followed them there, describing greenish-black slime coming up the staircase towards them. Yeah, no thanks. 
And finally, in first place, we have footage of an American exorcism. While the video is blurred out on YouTube to protect the identity of the poor girl, I personally think it's up there as one of the most frightening things I've ever seen. At an hour and 20 minutes long, it depicts a Catholic bishop in Connecticut attempting to converse with a demonic entity that has possessed the body of an innocent young woman, while her family restrains her. Ed and Lorraine were the ones to alert the church to the possession after meeting her during an audience chat session that was held at the conclusion of one of their public presentations. During portions of the exorcism, when prayer is done, you can hear the demon acting wildly, and it originally refuses to give its name, both of which are quite common in cases of demonic possession. Eventually we learn that there are four demons possessing our victim, with one of them identifying themselves as Robert, which happens to be a name associated with the son of Satan. I'll let a snippet roll now, allowing you to hear the woman for yourself. Number 5. The Kane Parsons Shorts Now if you're a fan of internet horror like uh, Slender Man, Marble Hornets, or the SCP Foundation, you know all that sort of stuff, then no doubt you're probably already well versed in the back rooms and all the horror those odorous 70s hallways emanate but I know my mom watches my videos sometimes, so I thought I'd start off with a quick summary and a flash of the most famous backrooms content before we really get into it. Initially starting life as a small post on a certain image board, you know the one, in 2019, backrooms refers to a space between realities that manifests as a dreary, never-ending stretch of abandoned office building hallways. A sea of stained yellow wallpaper and terrible carpets. What started as one small post really quickly developed into a fandom with everybody writing their own backstories, continuity, lore, and all these narratives coming together in a big cosmic gumbo in this setting of the fractal hallways that live between worlds. One of the most famous, and I would argue what kind of propelled the back rooms from underground horror community stuff to mainstream, was a series of short films by a very young YouTuber named Kane Parsons. Parsons kickstarted the trend of making backrooms found footage videos, which is what we're looking at today, and pretty much everything we're going to be looking at was inspired by what he worked on. It's fantastic stuff, honestly. Triply so when you learn that he was 16 years old when he made it. If you haven't seen any of them yet, I definitely say go check them out after this video. They're a great little bit of shoestring budget internet horror. The original video is probably the best little like microcosm of it. There's a bunch and bunch of them, but they're all well made. And if you really liked it and you think, hey, I'd enjoy that concept for roughly 90 minutes, I hope I can sit in a big room with 300 other people and eat some popcorn and do that. I got some fantastic news for you. A24 Productions is working on a feature length script about the back rooms. It's going to be directed by Parsons with collaboration from James Wan, who if you don't recognize the name was the director of Saw and the Conjuring. Time will tell if that movie will be a total hit or a flop, but nonetheless I think it's incredibly cool that an independent filmmaker is going to get to make a big horror movie before he can even legally rent a car. That's like so cool. And if you want more internet horror, you are in exactly the right place for it. Because you can click through on our channel and see the hundreds upon hundreds of scary videos we've been making for years. Put together some words that you like, you'll find something for it, I guarantee you. Stay subscribed, stay scared, and stay watching this video, okay? We got more backrooms coming up for you. Number four, no clipping through reality. Now, in that very first post that described the backrooms and created the, the initial lore, it said that the way you get to the backrooms is by no clipping through reality. If you spent most of your childhood outside playing sports with other kids and you weren't exclusively surfing the Steam forums, maybe the term no clip is unfamiliar with you. It's a video game development term, meaning no collisions, allowing you to pass through all objects in a digital space. It's mostly used for development, but it can also be a little cheat code in some games. I had a lot of fun no clipping through Half-Life 2 and feeling like I was some sort of temporal god, just like blitzing through all the levels in six seconds. The idea of no clipping in reality sounds kind of funny, but also if you like really thought about it, just terrifying. I mean, imagine if you woke up one day and physics just stopped working entirely. It would probably stress me out. You don't have to imagine much more, because thanks to a Redditor and TikToker by the handle of Active Hypocrite, we have a look at just what phasing through reality might look like. And, and here's where it would go. Starts kind of funny, the chair scrambling around like a source engine prop glitching out, and then not even 10 seconds later, our hapless protagonist finds themselves no clipping through reality and landing flat in the back rooms, presumably to spend out the rest of their days. Imagine how scary that would be. Your whole life's just upturned and half a second like that, you're enjoying reality reality, enjoying all the pleasures that existence has to offer, and then BAM! To the back rooms with ya. I gotta say, people give TikTok a lot of guff, and rightfully so, I've seen a lot of terrible things on there. But I do like how it's become a video platform for really quick, like, bite-sized little snacks of filmmaking. Any platform that allows creative people a medium for which to serve up scares, A-OK -okay with me. 
Number three, the entrance to the back rooms on Google Earth. It's a popular trend on TikTok lately where users claim that they're able to find doorways into the infamous back rooms, finding the portals that connect the realities between and that they can find these points on Google Earth. I've watched a bunch of them, some of them, I'm not gonna lie, pretty corny, but some of them are pretty fun, like the one I've found for you here. Posted to us from user Super Game Kit, and I, I, I have to throw this out here. The video in question, when it was posted, it was posted with the title, Not Fake. So if you had any doubts, well there it is, Not Fake. Duh. Not like anyone can attach photos to Google Earth or anything, no sir. Alright, we'll roll some of this clip in question. Now remember, this user found something strange in Japan. A big, mysterious looking complex. Maybe a high tech government institution. Something that wouldn't look too out of place in an SCP story or something. That's already odd enough, because I don't know what this building really is. When you zoom in on it like they did, you get an up close and personal view of everybody's favorite, never ending, liminal series of hallways, the back rooms. I like to think that if the back rooms are out there, you know, in between realities, this endlessly expanding space of musty hallways. The way to access it was through the most advanced high-tech facility. Billions of dollars spent to get trapped in a mysterious, stinky space. Isn't that mostly the plot of Stranger Things? Who knows what sort of research could be done on the back rooms? Who knows what sort of efforts have been made to reach them? You just try typing SV no clip zero. That's a little joke for uh, gamers up there. All I know is that it's not anything I'm looking to explore anytime soon, so I'm thankful for videos like this, where I can experience the back rooms from the comfort of my own reality with doorways and exits and an outside and everything. Number two, death rooms. I think we've been getting a little tame with these videos. And I mean, that's sort of the nature of the back rooms, isn't it? It's more about the strange wistfulness that comes from a place that's familiar, nostalgic, but unrecognizable, like a dream being described to you by someone else. Bit of an esoteric fear. But esoteric fear doesn't really make for good videos YouTubers can make stupid thumbnails in the faces reacting to about. So sometimes we gotta crank it up just a little bit while also meeting content guidelines. Much like the SCP Foundation, there's all sorts of contributors to the shared urban legend that is the back rooms. Some of them see the back rooms as a lot more hostile. Let's roll some of this recovered found footage from YouTuber ChuggoYT called The Death Walls. Whatever is going on in this clip is bad news bears and then some. We see it from the perspective of a couple of explorers donning hazmat suits, presumably from some super secret government institution you need black ops level clearance to even know about. Maybe the SCP Foundation? I could definitely see those guys getting involved in something like this. Whatever has happened though is absolutely horrible. We see the remnants of the investigation crew squished up against the walls. They had no clips set back to one, not zero. They're wedged in between the back rooms. Their insides are sprayed all over horrifically, but that might not even be the worst thing happening out there because whoever we're watching the footage of is running from something horrifying that we can't see. Now there's a lot of low effort content about the back rooms, all the 3 a.m. posts, all the silly reaction faces. There's some very cool independent filmmaking and creative work being done with the back rooms, and I always want to shout out a more creative one when I see it. It's only a minute long, and it gave me a little spook. So toss Chugga YT a like when you see him next, and tell him the top five scary gangs sent you. Number one, the pool rooms. Now, since the back rooms first started becoming popular around like 2019-ish, there are so many clips and videos of people recording their own experiences and everyone's got their own little like personal touch on what they think the back rooms is and really it's a shared internet horror story so nobody's got a wrong answer. There's a lot of really great ones worth checking out but I think some of them don't quite get what was making it so scary or, or unique in the first place. If it's just monsters and bad guys and scary writings on the walls, that's like any other horror setting. When the original post was just about a bizarre office space that looked familiar but off in a way that you can't really place. This video posted to Reddit called The Pool Rooms really captures that for me. It's an endless, sprawling, familiar location. It doesn't really look like anything out of reality. It looks almost like it could be like an abandoned shopping mall from the 80s or something. You know, that ceramic style, that trademark soulless architecture and design. You can tell where like a food court Taco Bell should be. Except it's all been mostly flooded up to about shin level. It's enough to be annoying, but not enough to be impossible to travel through. There is really something about this, for me at least. The stillness when something should be there. Something will leap out at you but never comes. Look at it for a long time and just think about how unpleasant it would be to be in there. Cold, 
lonely, constantly wet, no retrieval or even a moment to catch your breath and get dry. The back rooms and the whole concept of it is, is scariest when I think it's like a, a dream that you're only sort of half remembering. You're not sure what's real and what isn't. Everything in this video has been real though, I'll tell you that. I would never tell you something fake on this channel. I love the pool rooms, I love the aesthetic of it. The Redditor who posted it, one Jared Pike, does a lot of cool art very much in this style of like scary liminal spaces on his personal Instagram. So if you were like me and you were enamored by the haunting beauty of this clip, give the guy a follow because it ain't easy for a struggling artist out there. Not like, not like I would know anything about that. <laughs>